Okay, guys. Let's start. Welcome back, everyone. This is the Citizen's Prerogative Podcast, brought to you by Citizen Do Good. Citizen Do Good for the sake of our republic. In times like these, being a citizen is a big job. Thank you for joining us to celebrate the virtues of self-rule and the state of our republic. Welcome to the Citizen's Prerogative Podcast. This is the voice of your nerdy host, Michael Piscatelli, and we are all graced with the presence of a co-host whose passion for our republic precedes him wherever he goes, my dear friend, the lovely Raymond Wong Jr. So kind, so kind. (laughs) Welcome to episode two, everyone. Title of this episode is Hello, Sovereignty. We have a standard docket on the episode. We're going to cover three topics like we did in episode one. First up, let's t- we're going to talk about sovereignty being an idea that can only materialize with power, through power. So we'll talk about what that means. We'll also um, uh, cover our defense apparatus as being a part of our exceptionalism. So um, today, today, you should know, I should have started out with the fact that today is November 11th, 2020, and it is Veterans Day today. Um, coincidentally we started recording the podcast today we already did episode one um feels good this is episode two we decided to dedicate it to today um we oriented the themes to today and chose sovereignty hello sovereignty as the title of the episode because it's really the context that i think we need to think about the military in um, as we move forward when we think about the Republic. So um, anyway, back to it. So we're, we're, we're obviously we're talking about sovereignty today. We're talking about um, the defense apparatus, the military. And we'll close today with topic three, more than words. We need to put in the work of demonstrating appreciation for our military. Um, and, and we'll talk about a little bit what that means as well in action. So with that, let's go ahead and jump right in. Sovereignty is an idea that only materializes with power. So for the notes that I had here, I was talking about defining the idea of sovereignty um, and what power is required to bring it into fruition. Um, You know, is it, it's weird that the Declaration of Independence worked right? Um, It's one thing to declare yourself a sovereign state. It's another thing to enforce it. You think of the Declaration of Independence and it's a birth of a nation, right? We say, oh, in July, and we signed the declaration, it was done. But in fact, uh, the birth of the nation has been an ongoing context for generations. The, the, The nation... In fact, the declaration itself wasn't so much to officially tell Britain that we were not part of them. The declaration was a mechanism to tell the United States itself, to tell the 13 colonies why they were seceding, why they were breaking away. So the thing that's unique about the Declaration of Independence is it's not just a document to say we are choose to be free. It's a justification why, as citizens, we deserve to be free. Uh, we weren't writing this together. We didn't have internet. We didn't have collaboration tools, right? So people that saw the Declaration of Independence, though it was coming from the people of the United States, most of them were seeing it for the first time. Ray, I do have to back up one second there. That is an excellent point. Thank you. Um, But for anybody who couldn't hear you after you said the birth of a nation, I, I just want to set everybody right that uh, we aren't talking about lost cause propaganda <laughs> we were talking legitimately about the birth of the united states <laughs> oh, just to be clear <clears throat> i found that a bit triggering i was like oh no the birth of a nation <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> that's yeah, another yeah. episode that's a whole other I, I speak from the heart ladies and gentlemen so please don't take anything it's not a hidden agenda but what an interesting thing, a bunch of uh, cis, white, rich, relatively rich landowning guys got together, put their names on a piece of paper and said to the hell with you, King of England and your 
religious, you know, um, idolatry. <laughs> it, mm-hmm. it, we're going to, we're going to do our own thing over here. We don't need one King. Uh, we, we can be 13 Kings if we want. Um, but we hope that the Republic will be more democratic than that over time. I'm paraphrasing on their behalf. That's the, well, I think that the core message was, um, one of the core tenants was, you know, uh, representation, um, no taxation without representation. Oh, so if Boston you think of Tea it, Party. Yeah, they, 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 they hung it on very specific um, taglines that the people could understand. And the language is very simple because those were the issues. That, that was the kitchen table issues, if you will. No doubt. So interesting. We, uh, some folks, our ancestors, some of our ancestors signed a piece of paper, um, and, but, but that's not it. That's, that's not really where it all ends. I mean, you can't. You can't have sovereignty if you can't defend it, if you can't create that defensible space. I mean, I I think of it as, well, why would I go to biology? Because I'm crazy. And I always think of strange metaphors for these things. But you think about a cell wall. A cell can't exist without a cell wall. So it needs that permeable membrane. That's what the military, that's what armies, that's what the ability to defend ourselves does. It forms that self cell wall. It's permeable good services, people, ideas can transfer through it, um, but it protects us. It creates a safe space. It creates a, a defensible space for our laws, our ideas, our culture, our values to take hold um, and, and for us to live how we want to live in this mm-hmm. space. Uh, I think it's really important. So, I mean, sovereignty is, it's a big word for a simple idea, um, but there's a lot to it. And it's a, it's a long, sorted past, okay? So a lot of Americans are misunderstood thinking there was never an invasion on U.S. soil. That is not a correct statement. Um, you have to ask, you know, why did we go to war in 1812 with the British? It was to express our sovereignty, right? They, they were pushing us around. Their merchant ships were, were pushing our merchant ships around. So it was an expression of sovereignty. Now, most people don't realize the British invaded and they burned the White House to the ground. And if you're 18, 1812, 1812, what I tell 1912, war, thank war, you. War of 1812. War of 1812. Michael's going to keep us as, as, as succinct as possible. Do my best. Over. My brain goes all over the place. Um, but, you know, in that war, they burned the White House to the ground. And, and it's funny because our history books don't even cover it. It wasn't until I worked for a company that financed the repainting of the White House. It was, it was, it was, we do talk about major institutions, right? It was Bank of America, their legacy institution they bought out, repainted the White House. And that's how I learned that the British had invaded and in fact destroyed it. Now, you can blame my lack of attention in maybe history class, but I, I'd rather blame the history class because education is not inspiring in this country. Oh, we're going to have. Oh, that's another episode. Don't you worry. I've got, we've got a lot to talk about education. Uh, air quotes on that. <laughs> oh, so fun. Um, so here I was just noticing, you know, our country, try as we may, try as we might, we just can't seem to get the army just right. Uh, Americans historically have always been leery of armies due to quartering orders um, under the crown. So there's some, I'm throwing out some lingo there, but you know, when, when this was, when the 13 colonies were under British rule, um, the Brits were a little concerned about us potentially revolting or just being, you know, insolent. Uh, law and order, the original law and order had British military officers living in our homes inside our homes they, they you had to you know your whole family lived in one room and they got to occupy another and they got to come and go freely and then they could keep an eye on your conversations who you're transacting with who you know they it, it was horrible i didn't live through it um but i can i'm empathizing with it as i'm talking about it and i uh can definitely understand why americans were always leery of, of armies you know with the early experiences of quarter having them quartered in their homes um, but, you know, our militians, our militia were the thing of early settlement. So, I mean, they, they've been here with the original settlers to defend their occupied lands from native peoples. Um, 
so you know it's a long it's a storied history but it's always been uh like i said it, we just can't seem to get it right it's always it's serving a purpose or it's a reaction and and so we love it but we fear it um and and today we enjoy the fruits of a, a global economic order uh enforced under private public global military industrial complex partnerships i mean it's there are large privately owned companies that are involved in contracting paramilitary services we obviously have our own uh military uh post-world war ii which is a part of a global order and uh the more business can lobby um the more their interests become intertwined uh you know it, it just kind of starts to become one integrated system and that's that's kind of where we're at now. And Americans don't think about it too much because most of our military operations are overseas. Um, and we, you know, we haven't had a war on our soil outside of Japan bombing Pearl Harbor um, since the revolution. <laughs> I think I'm trying to, I'm trying to think, I mean, obviously war of 1812, we had a lot of skirmishes with the British and then the Spanish after that, that's how we got, um, Puerto Rico, you know, we've, we've, those, I consider those more the empire wars, but long story short, I digress. Um, well, let's not, you're not digressing. Okay. First off, you, you said, you said it very clearly that, you know, so, so back in the empire war, so the Spanish sent the troops in to find gold to line the coffers, right? Well, it's just different. So who's in charge now? It's not, the United States government, they're not the kings, it's the corporations. So in turn, we are going to war and major corporations like Halliburton are making profit. So we've just shifted who was in power. It's not the Spanish government anymore. It is Halliburton. It is major corporations who line their pockets off of death. So you're right, this sordid past with our military is dangerously um, dark. Look at it. We are going into a country um, killing people and we are being killed. And meanwhile, private corporations are making profits. There's something wrong there. We're focused on the wrong things. Yeah. Yeah, it's, there's a lot that we need to examine. I agree too. And in those spaces. And I think one of the points we're, we'll close out this section. I think one of the main points we want to cover is just the, you know, the fact that we need the military. It's a good necessary thing. Evil. It's necessary evil. got to have it. Yeah. We wouldn't exist without it. We can't exist without it. Not in, not the way that sure. geopolitics are today. Right. So we will always advocate for military. We yes. will always advocate for what makes sense for the purpose of the military to maintain the cell wall for the sake of our Republic. To provide the common defense that will, anything that's in the constitution is part of what we are fighting for folks. And guess what? The common defense is as clear as day. And that's where the military comes in and that's where sovereignty comes in. So normally this is going to be, the, this would be the part of the episode where we have a nice mid roll and uh, we cut over for a sponsorship, a sponsorship notice, except I haven't actually properly queued that up. Um, so I'm going to cut over to one I already had. Here's a message from our sponsor, Citizen Do Good. Fulfilling a dream where all possess an intricate love for self-rule that is reciprocated with equal justice under the law? Those are the values that Citizen Do Good believes in. We believe in all of the amendments, including the Constitution, and all of the amendments that have yet to come that help to make this a more perfect union. Um, so we're asking you to support our sponsor, Citizen Do Good. Head over to citizendogood.com and uh, go ahead and sign up. You can join our mailing list and stay up to date on the latest news and announcements. You can also um, become a supporter through our Patreon and you'll gain access um, to behind the scenes content that uh, um, the unpaid subscriptions uh, don't send out. And you'll also be invited for um, feedback sessions and you'll get discounts at our shop. Um, while you're there, uh, check out the shop. See if there's any merchandise that tickles your fancy. Um, please feel free to purchase any of those items. It'll support us and help us 
a long way. And if there's anything out there that you'd like to see that you don't see, go ahead and drop us a line. Make sure you join in the community and leave a comment. Um, there's a contact us page also at citizendogood.com. Thank you for your support. With that, I'm gonna go ahead and switch us over onto topic two. So talking a little bit about our defense apparatus and being a part of our exceptionalism. So we talked to, you know, we talked about the context, why we appreciate the military, why it's important, why we have to have it. And we need to care for it. We need to care for it properly because it's, it's a dangerous tool. Um, it's a deadly tool. Uh, it's a serious tool. Uh, I think we touched on that a little bit in the last segment as well. We have now, so talking about today, we have the most professional and capable military, but all apparatus at such a scale have weaknesses. So let's be real here, right? Other countries are investing in areas where those weaknesses persist in our military and they will strike out at us given a chance to win, um, especially as we're untwining ourselves economically. One of the big ideas coming out of World War II after Bretton Woods was we would create a global economic order that would help ensure peace and prosperity because when you're doing business with people, you tend to not want to shoot them. Pretty sound logic, you know. And so we've had, for the most part, it hasn't been particularly fair, um, I would say, or good for everybody involved, but there has been an economic order <laughs> um, and it has uh, more or less uh, made sure that there was some peace. There's peace among the biggest players. Now the United States, we'll talk about war execution elsewhere another time. Um, but right now we're just talking about the economic ties and those coming undone, say with Russia and China and, and other major potential powers or regional power players you know, if, if we aren't going to be so twined economically, then it's going to increase the probabilities that we will have armed conflict. And who's to say that some people aren't planning for it anyway, regardless of what economic ties there were. Um, so it's just a long way to say we need to stay vigilant, right? And, you know, one of the weaknesses, I was talking about weaknesses in our system. I put that in because I was reading an article about the fact that if we got into a war with China, all they'd have to do is take out 20 of our ships um, because we only have the capacity to replace like 20 ships a year. Like we do not have the building capacity that we once did. Now there's all a bunch of statistics and numbers around that, but ultimately the point of rattling all of that off is just to il illustrate the fact that we've rested on our laurels and resting on your laurels is so, not planning or building for the future. <laughs> I mean, people need historical context. Okay. The Bush administration who was uh, the, uh, that did conduct a good amount of war based on historical fact. We do discuss historical facts here at, at a uh, citizen do good and uh, at citizens prerogative. The Bush administration, uh, Bush jr. Is that what he's called? W? <laughs> he, he, all we did is we took old bombs that were sitting in storage and tied them. Do you remember the Moab, the mother of all bombs? It was just standard stock bombs that they tied all together to make a big boom. And ladies and gentlemen, that is not innovation. Okay. That is not, that is not staying the, that is not ensuring that you have a cutting edge military that is ready to challenge our foes, people that would do us wrong. I'm talking about the military industrial complex. It isn't doing us any favors. I mean, resting on laurels, you know, it goes, goes through the whole system. So Boeing, what Boeing did with the 737 Max or whatever the heck it's right. called, that's been happening in other areas of the industry. And let me tell you, our military spending is a boondoggle. We're going to be talking about that. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of money. I mean, they've got us pointing fingers at each other about uh, vouchers and, um, you know, people getting um, schooling and healthcare. And the, the military is a huge part of our budget. And I'm not saying we shouldn't spend it. I think that though, we would, we should have a lot more for our money. <laughs> think we should have uh, a lot more for our money. So 
Um, there's a lot more to cover there, but uh, the point being that there are weaknesses in our system and there is no convincing evidence that we're really doing anything to, to address them. There's, there seems to be a bit of a quagmire. And honestly, you know, some of the latest decisions coming out of the administration that we've had has not served us well, has not served the military well either. Um, just it as an apparatus, much less the idea that there's a lot of risk in having a commander in chief with complete unchecked authority, like um, like a king. I mean, that's the most king-like thing we have. The presidency is the most king-like thing we have, but the most king-like power, unchecked, unfettered, unchecked raw power is for the president to take military action, especially with nuclear weapons. Um, they're very, there's no one who can really get in the way of that. And if you, if you don't feel comfortable and confident that the person that's there is making the right decision, um, there's something to be worried about because there are no checks and balances between that individual nuclear codes. I was just watching an episode of something on that recently. Um, and it's very unnerving. So, you know, just back to the idea that we have, we have a precarious relationship with our military um, just as much as anything uh, because of its size, its complexity and um, the relative, you know, lack of oversight over such a thing for, for a Republic to have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a lot going on there. So in any case, pivoting our focus a little bit from, you know, some of the weaknesses in the, the actual apparatus or maybe even how we govern some of that apparatus. Uh, I, I also want to point out our soldiers and our veterans. We ask Americans, we have a voluntary military, people join of their own will, and we do not necessarily take care of them well, treat them well. Um, there's something to be said while you're in the service, what is good treatment or, you know, what, what should be experienced? Cause it's, it's a unique thing to go through. It's not civilian life, obviously. Uh, but especially on the veteran side of things, because at least the military treats active soldiers as an asset and invests in them as an asset. It does not have the same view about our, our veterans. And by extension, we don't. Like, if our government does not treat veterans well, we are not treating our veterans well. We, you, me, us. And that's a problem because we spend, again, a ton of money. The question uh, is why, like you said, spending money. Why do I pay taxes? If, if, you, if it is on the citizens, um, if we're supposed to feed and care for our veterans individually, then stop taking my money. Stop taxing me so I have that capacity. Yeah, give me the fund to, to divert my resources to. I mean, I'd much rather it come out of my taxes. I'd much rather, you know, everybody's oh, yeah. paying their fair share. And we know that it's being covered because the government is backing the expenses. But I totally agree. I, you know, I, it's frustrating. That's a, that's a very frustrating black box. And, and we do, we, we are going to um, come back with <laughs> actionable steps that people can take um, to help improve this. I mean, for now, I think we can just raise the awareness or continue to not let the awareness um, fade away too much because there's a lot going on right now. But today is Veterans Day. And it's important to cover that. This won't air on Veterans Day, but that's maybe the best part about it, right? Um, not worrying about homeless people only on Thanksgiving, not worrying yeah. about, you know, people in need. And I don't mean to equate veterans with homeless, but you know what? America has a problem with that. We have a lot of homeless veterans. I mean, homelessness is in and of itself something we're going to talk about, but it is a big disproportionate effect on, on veterans. And it says something about our society and how we care for people who have problems. What, we, understand. what is the st statistical number of, you know, homeless veterans ever like, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but they give it, the media pushes it out all the time. Why aren't we just focusing on the fact they're homeless? Why aren't we, it's always in the context of that we've been improving and we have less homeless veterans and, and individuals say things, I've done more for veterans than anybody else. But can't, that 
negates the fact that so many are still left behind. Again, we, as a great nation, as we become larger, um, the 1% that's left behind, the 2%, unfortunately for, I believe for uh, VA, it's much higher than that. Uh, but even 1% is a substantial amount of loss and, and strain on our system that shouldn't be there. It's almost like the system is its own worst enemy. Well, and it's the system we created, so it's time for us to take some ownership here, right? right. Um, step by step. So, you know, lots of work to do there. So that was, the, you know, that's that's a bit, uh, the one last topic around areas of weakness or opportunity. I, You know, this isn't going to be a negative podcast, but it's got to be real. Call it being real here. Yes. We do have a lot of advances on the horizon that are going to further remove people from the line of fire, which on the surface sounds great. Uh, but the more I let it sink in, the more it weighs on me, it concerns me. Um, you know, there's a lot of risks in automating warfare, automating armed conflict. Um, and that's what we're talking about when we're taking humans out of the line of fire. Well, we're putting in place robots. I mean, to put it ineloquently. Well, and we let's are take it a, I'll take it a little further, Michael. The, with the American people are, are already robots. They already see us as just numbers and just machines in this greater cog, right? The, the elite in power, unfortunately, for better or for worse, and I'm looking forward to them coming on this organization and telling us otherwise, but it appears that they already consider us machines. So what happens when there are real machines at the front line? The decisions will be even less humanized than they are today. Oh, yeah, because behind each of those machines, I mean, for a time, maybe a human, but after a short time, there will be no humans behind the operation of those machines. It's going to be machines operating machines. Again, it's already here in various places. It's going to be everywhere. We're going to cover that from an economic perspective, mostly, um, later on. But I, in in the context of military, it's just it takes on a frighteningly different um, connotation because you think about with the Arnold Schwarzenegger film Terminator and, and, you know, Skynet and all that, because that's, that's very real. And what worries me more than any malicious American who has access to that type of technology is a foreign actor gaining access to that type of technology. Um, you know, especially if they were to hack our, our stuff. Um, so we are not, conspiracy theorists people uh let's be very clear you know i know michael did reference a, a, a terminator-esque era that you know that is possibly real but these are based on facts and, and the fact of the matter is that we have turned on ai technology companies like google ibm etc have turned on ai computers that invented their own language because they saw our language is inefficient they saw the BIOS language as inefficient, so they created a new language and they had to turn the computers off because we didn't know what they were saying. So it's not, this is not some uh, um, conspiracy theory or it's not um, out of the realm of possibility. Um, things are moving fast, technology is moving fast, and if we remain um, asleep at the wheel, like we said early on, um, you are going to be shocked when you're blindsided. Yeah, things are changing exponentially. I think Ray, Ray Kurzweil is famous for talking about something. I don't think he coined it, but he calls it the singularity. Um, and it's the point at which the rate of change happens so fast we can't even perceive it. <laughs> you know, it's kind of happening beyond our capability of even knowing it's happening. It's, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting risk. And one thing I want to throw out there is that you mentioned in that anecdote about having to interrupt the two AI bots that were chatting. Um, yeah, in the United States, we interrupt them. I believe though in other nations, maybe like China, they don't interrupt those bots. You know, maybe they don't have the same sense of um, 
concern or apprehension or, or, you know, anything like that. Maybe they're more concerned about being first to it. I mean, that's the first, that was the first, you know, theoretically the first time any cloning of a human was ever done. And I think they, they arrested him. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. But you know, it's, they, they're, they're, they're very in China, I believe is very interested in being on the cutting edge to prove themselves, you know, and it makes sense when you look at history, we're not going to go into it now, but um again every you want to know why oh why is it why is it why is it well you can go back you can generally find that there's a trend somewhere there's a pattern somewhere um in history so there's some cause and effect at play behind all these things so you know but like we we don't want you to to fall into a dark web or a QAnon conspiracy just because you're trying to find answers, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Citizen Do Good is not here for you to go hunt up the answer and bring it back to us and, and create an argument. Um, actually, we're trying to invoke forward thought. So initially, we're going to be asking challenging questions. We're going to bring challenging ideas. And that's because we want to invoke a very passionate argument and debate about what the future holds for our union. So thank Think of this as a space where we're not going to go down the rabbit hole of facts and see who can who can dominate in the dog pile of history. Uh, instead, we're going to open up these sores, and some of you may be very offended by some of the stuff we said, and that's good. That's where the conversation comes from. And the point is, we're going to continue to lean into it respectfully, and as philosophers, as the as the founding fathers did, we all are philosophers. I want people naked with robes on, of course, um, and, and talking about uh, the future and what it takes to make this run. Our sovereignty counts on engagement at all levels. I think you can sum it up, the military, um, education, it's just, just across the board. Totally. So we might be belaboring the point, but all Americans should care about the military. You know, well, how, how it works, uh, where it doesn't work well, where we can be making sure we're applying the right priorities. Uh, serving is a sacrifice in ways that full-time civilians can never possibly understand. Um, I, you know, and I identify with that experience because I've not been through the military. Um, and you have to respect that. We all have to respect that. And we need to make sure we're putting the priorities in the right place. So if you enjoy having a country with laws like the United States, you care about our military. If you wonder where all your tax dollars go, uh, it's a big bucket. You should care about the military. If you don't want to live in a world where flying robots kill your family with a missile by accident, then you probably care about the military. Uh, we won't go into it now, but your local law enforcement might be next in line for hand-me-downs just like these. So you care about the military. <laughs> uh, so, you know. Accidents happen. I think they St call it collateral damage. It's, it's, again, just yet another statistic how in the United States we accept mediocrity and we accept, uh, we accept okay standards. <laughs> oh where's the logic the humanity and the logic <laughs> um so here's a here's a call to action shout out we're going to close out this topic here uh, learn more about what's going on with the majority of your tax dollars by checking out some reputable military blogs inform your opinion on how well your tax dollars are spent check out jane's defense news military times military watch popular mechanics history channel i mean you can dig into you know some of how things have come to be um they they always have some interesting perspectives to share so uh we encourage you to seek new and different and diverse credible reputable sources of information but gain a different perspective we are not obsessed with your loyalty and undying commitment to us we encourage you to expand thought we encourage you to challenge the status quo and let us be one of your resources amongst many we don't have to be your only resource but those of you that have chosen to stick with us time and time again we thank you thank you guys Pay special attention to the needs being unmet for our veterans too. Um, you know, this, this is one of the areas that 
I, all right, I won't belabor it, but we, we can do way better. And we owe it to every veteran to do way better than we do now. Okay. Um, so I'd like you to, you know, keep an eye out on that and look for any solutions that might be coming um, across your desk or check out what your elected representatives positions or opinions on, on any of the work that's currently going on through Congress. I mean, everybody says, Oh, call your representative. But I mean, if you're honestly, this is an area where it's one very specific thing of action. You can reach out to them and get a very direct response. I would hope um, because you want to know what they're championing for veterans, what veteran services, how are they helping to improve the VA or implement or support alternatives to the VA if we can't get our act together. Um, I know that there are several individuals out there who of their own volition have started organizations, whether they be nonprofits or for-profits. I mean, we can talk about why there's no difference. I think we'll talk, we will talk about why there's no difference um, yes. in the future. But, you know, there are people out there doing the hard work, doing the good work on the ground of connecting veterans with the resources they don't even know are available to them. So like we, A, we fund these things. There are programs, but then we don't do anything to make sure they, they connect to the people who need them. So right. what, what's the point, you know? So let's find out what, what our representatives are doing to mine those gaps because it's a problem we created. It's a problem we can fix. Um, and it shouldn't rely on a patchwork of nonprofits. So I'll leave you with that thought. Anything else ready to close out this one? Goodness, there's so many different ways to close it out. But, I, you know, a lot of these initial episodes might seem, um, you know, that we're definitely trying to cover a lot of ground. And, and I think even Michael and I are surprised is there's so much we really have to talk about when we pull back layer after layer after layer. I want to stress to our new listeners that this is a journey, a journey we intend to have with you and a journey that we expect to be robust and vibrant and, and very engaging in the sense that um, it's, it's very easy for uh, someone to say, call your congressman. It's very easy for someone to say, uh, write a letter, action, action, action. But right now, what we actually need is a robust conversation on what we want. When people sit down and you say, what do you want? If, if you had the chance and the president pulled you in the room right now and he said, what do you want? You've got your chance. Go. How many of you are going to know exactly what to ask for? Uh, some of us are going to say Black Lives Matter. Some of us are going to say that all lives matter. Some of us are going to say that blue lives matter. And that's a problem, ladies and gentlemen. That is not a need for your family, your friends, or anything. That is a tagline, and that is propaganda. And that's where we live. We are mired in propaganda. Our organization is here to cut through the fog and find the answer and start to coordinate a unified message wouldn't be shocking if we actually got on the same page as Americans. And as long as we're not on the same page, the people in power remain in power. So get out of your own way, America. Michael and I don't know if we are the solution, but we're willing to try. We're willing to say, can we all get along? I think we can. I think Ray and I have been in business as long as we've been kids. Maybe we've been in kids longer than we've been alive, but whatever. I don't do math. <laughs> um, we can. We can. I mean, we've, Ray and I in our professional lives have bridged major chasms. I mean, there are ways in which you can focus on what you're constructing, on what you're building, on what you can accomplish together. Not what you can't. There's, if you put in front of you the things you can't do, well, you're going to not get things done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So you, it's so much of this is about where you put your focus and we have a hundred percent faith in that we've had success. We've demonstrated success in that. And we, we rely heavily on that experience and our intuitive sense of logic to be like, Oh, you know, that's a distraction. Mm -hmm. Oh, Nope. That's a red herring or whatever it is, you know, and we'll talk more about logical fallacies because I think that's a logical fallacies are a fundamental that, we don't get taught at any point. I don't know no, if that's no, good no. English. <laughs> no, there's no, I mean, I don't know if we're here to judge that. That's not what the constitution said. Uh, but the, I know that we, we, with the education system and, and a lot of it's going to come down to how we've handled education. Uh, education was a system meant to make us complacent factory workers. And uh, guess what? The world's changed, but 
education has not. So it's an uninspiring world we live in, but it's, it's systematically purposeful. It's meant to be uninspiring. Nobody wants you to think creatively or think constructively. They like when we say life sucks and then you die. They like when you say it's a rat race. They like that you are mired by your own self-loathing. Keeps us distracted. I guess, yeah. but, but that's not the, again, positive tone, right? Like, we don't want you to think that we are defeatists or we're, 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 we're over here saying the world is a terrible place. We're actually positive and we're actually very excited about what we're going to accomplish together. But we will never back down from the bad news. Everyone's afraid to talk about bad news. Yeah, no, no. We want to inspire togetherness, but we have to stare at the deep heart of the ugliness that exists. I mean, that's, that's part of where the inspiration has to come from, saying, we don't want that. That is not good for us. Um, it's something you can feel it. Uh, and if you don't, then you're probably not listening. <laughs> this podcast uh all right so let's wrap it up we've got uh one more topic i'm gonna um power us through whatever else was on the agenda more than words more than words we need to put in the work of demonstrating appreciation for our military so Today, uh, today, the day we're recording this episode, I mentioned earlier, happens to be Veterans Day, and we didn't plan it that way, but it happened. And we think of it as serendipity. <laughs> this is a great topic for us to discuss. It's, um, it is. It's just great. And, and, and one of the things we want to cover as we're closing this out, this last thing is about how best to celebrate Veterans Day, how best to celebrate veterans in general, how best to celebrate the military um, at the same time, you know, applying whatever critical thought, critical examination, um, identifying things that can be improved about it, right? No one thing needs to be painted as all good or all bad or all right or all wrong. Um, there's just too much gray. There's too much nuance in life. We really need to pick things down to the specifics. And so this very myopic moment, I want to be about how to celebrate. Um, let's talk a little bit about how we do celebrate, how it's common, how we usually celebrate this kind of thing, but what, what might be a better way to do it? And Ray and I aren't going to have the answers to this one. Hate to break it to you guys. Um, but we're going to talk about it a little bit here and, and the challenge will be for you all to help us with it um, by joining the community and giving us your perspective. Ray and I haven't served. Uh, I, our hope is that some of you out there who are listeners have served and can help share your perspective and, and join the community and um, help bring everyone along for the ride for your truth. So with that being said, um, what do we do? We have, we have a parade? Barbecue. Barbecue? You know, get together. The weather is usually good. Veterans, you know, it's not too cold some places. I think it's regional, right? Because some parts of the country are a little bit colder. Uh, but I do think it's a time that you kind of spend together. And I think it's a time to eat. So it's a time for family, without a doubt. Yeah, you're right. I'm thinking very American, very right. barbecue, American flags. Right. Growing up in the 90s during the Gulf War, there was yellow ribbons everywhere um, back in Connecticut. That's where I grew up. Um, so, you know, people bring out their stars and stripes. Togetherness may be a parade. But is that enough? That's branding. That is, that is lip service. That is, that is window dressing. Um, to me, I, I always thought, you know, it's surprising to me that on days like um, Veterans Day, which is a national holiday, we all should lean into volunteering. I'm all for the for the for the uh, for the, the picnic or the the barbecue, right? But let's all volunteer first at the first half of the day, and to give back to the community some way, and then we get together and have our barbecue, right? It's all about the reason to party, and that that is a challenge for me in a lot of it. And that's why, you know, so let me pause there. Yeah. I, I was thinking who benefits 
like so you have the picnic you have the parade you have all of that stuff and right. so for maybe the parade you know you can give the fact that uh, you know it, there's a sense there can be some sense of community you know people are coming out um to show their love and support right um, or, and then i understand if i were to actually have turned on the television today some people were probably speaking um at various cemeteries and graves uh to show respect for all of our fallen soldiers which i think is good too um but it just feels half-hearted when it's only one day a year or right. even if it's a few days a year because you know we have v-day and you know we celebrate certain uh, historical monumental military events but not all of them equally um you know we don't veterans day is really the one holiday who benefits the most i i just feel like it's not the veterans it's it should be and the it should overwhelming be. majority, right? It should be. And the volunteering point is, is good, yeah. I think. I think the volunteering piece is good. And then, and then paying it forward one step further, it's like, well, then, and then what's the daily? And that's probably always going to be the thing, right? Because we always pick a holiday to help the less, quote, unquote, less fortunate. First of all, let's stop creating the less fortunate. Yeah, like how about that? Yeah. But with it, we can't solve that on this episode. Um, but Not on this episode. <laughs> maybe the whole, maybe by the time we die. <laughs> Just kidding. Sorry. That was depressing. Uh, but in any case, yeah, let's think about it. Let's be a little more cognizant. I think that's the place to start, at least be aware of it. Like I'm, oh, I just bought a bunch of hamburgers and hot dogs. So I'm going to go spend time with my friends. What veterans benefited in the, in the making of that party? Probably very few unless there are some that work at the grocery store and that's coincidence. The volunteer thing is good. How can we be more conscientious about focusing where we put that time and energy to make sure that it's going to the veterans? And, and again, this isn't, this isn't going to be solved by one podcast. Oh, just give me one moment. I'll give that left hand thing. This isn't going to be solved through one podcast. This is a generational issue. Uh, I, I keep telling people that I'm going to have these conversations for the rest of my life. And I'm ready for it because I don't expect that this next Veterans Day, 365 days from today, everyone's going to be volunteering. I don't expect that. But I'm hoping in 365 days, you will be having conversations with your family at that barbecue that you didn't like. Hey, you guys, have you ever thought about maybe we should volunteer or, or maybe you just invoke um, a philosophical conversation, which is really what we want, which is, hey, do you think you do enough for our veterans or, or what maybe go around the table like you do at Thanksgiving and say, hey, uh, uh, what does Veterans Day mean to each of you? At least do it for the children, for goodness sake. We can't save ourselves. We're all old, jaded, and broken <laughs> from the American system. Um, but the children can still be saved. And if they hear us talking about it, they're going to talk. And nobody talks about Veterans Day unless you have a vet veteran in your family, frankly. You know, and, and most do, but not. they better be in your immediate family. Otherwise, you still don't understand the sacrifice. And it's not comfortable. Um, when I think back to it, because I did have um, veterans in my family or active military officers, you know, it was, it, I don't know why, and I can't explain it, but it always felt like a touchy subject. Um, there's a lot of emotion about the military for a lot of reasons. And I think sometimes we just don't know how to approach it. Like I even think about it when people debate whether they should thank people for their service randomly when they come across them at an airport. Um, and they happen to be in uniform and things like that. And it's like, okay, I mean, that is, that's something. Um, and let's talk about it. Uh, but is it the best way to do it? Or is it just one way to do it because we haven't actually kind of honestly yeah. talked about it, right? Because it's uncomfortable. I, I, th I feel like it's uncomfortable, maybe because I'm a citizen and I'm not a military person, but that makes me want to talk about it. I, I, I can't help but say, you know, when you come across a military person, you say, I, I'm guilty of it too. Thank you for your service, right? But again, is it because you're guilty that you do absolutely nothing for them, right? So you're guilty. And in the same sense, you know, it's, I, it challenges me when you come across that individual. And that is someone you cannot deny. We all can't deny that we owe them something, right? 
Uh, but it's interesting, slavery, uh, same token, you don't come across a black, you know, an African-American person and say, you know, oh, thank you for building our cities. Your sacrifice? Yeah, yeah, thank you, you know. Thank I, you I for mean, your free labor and Yeah, do we say suffering? I, I'm not sure. So if it's not good enough for slavery, then it's probably not good enough for the military. There's something greater that we have to do to make things better. Amen. So we'll open it up with that, but we ain't closing it down today. Ugh. Touchy stuff. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, you know, ultimately it's all about finding ways to give back. And, and, and I think, I think the core of it is knowing is, is being respectful and knowing and feeling, finding your gratitude, finding the reason why you're grateful for that person having served to change the feeling about it. And I, I think that was one of the kind of the, one of the points or hopes I had for this episode and framing it around sovereignty um, is the idea that we are thankful. We are grateful. We are grateful m- more for the, more than the apparatus. We are grateful for what it offers us. Um, it offers us our freedom and that we should respect and be grateful to those who participate in it because it is a sacrifice. It's not something all of us are willing to do. Um, so try to, yeah, come at it with gratitude. At that, um, I'm all out of it. Anything else, Ray? Um, no, this is a this is a tough subject, and I really don't know if we're even going to keep this part right here. But you know, the the military is their part. They're the only reason we exist today. Um, in so many fashions, you know, even if you go from the revolution, right? It, an outnumbered group of individuals took on one of the largest militaries in the world and a professional military at that. And so like it or not, military force is the beginning and end of the human experience. And we can go down the rabbit hole and we will, ladies and gentlemen, we plan to have plenty of content on this, uh, but it is no accident why the Europeans had so much power. It's because they had the least amount of land available to them. So competition bred power. It wasn't ordained by God. It wasn't in the stars. Guns, germs, and steel. And what is it? What do you like to say? Um, scarcity. 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 Yeah. Oh, gosh, yeah. There's so much to be... So much to talk about on scarcity, too. I can't wait. That's a prime example of Europe. All those people sharing that little bit of land, oh, of course they had to rule the world. Competition. Competition early and often. It began with the Neanderthals. So mm-hmm. uh, it's a long, long history, hundreds of thousands of years. Well, well, I think we'll go ahead and wrap it up there because the digression is beginning. Um, so with that, For more information on this and other episodes, head over to citizendogood.com and click on Citizens Prerogative. While you're there, register to log in and leave a comment to continue the conversation. We'd love to hear from you. We have been your hosts. Thank you, Mr. Raymond Wong Jr. And thank you, Mr. Piscatelli. It has been refreshing. It has been something for sure. So special thanks uh, to for our intro music, OK Class by Ozzy Jock under Creative Commons license through freemusicarchive.org. Other music provided royalty free through uh, Fessalillion Studios, Inc. And we'd like to say thank you to our listeners. We save the best for last. You are the best. You have been for years. Thank you for your support. We know it's painful and we love you. Take care.